Welcome to Permaculture Voices. I'm your host, Diego, D-I-E-G-O. What do you do if you have a passion and there's no one out there offering you a job to fulfill that passion or a job that aligns with your values? One option is just to work any job, forgetting what you actually are passionate about. And that's what most people do. And I think most people can attest to the fact that that option sucks. Another option is to find the intersection between your passions and your strengths and problems that need solving and solve those problems by starting a business. And that's what this episode is about, starting permaculture-based businesses. This podcast is the audio from Rob Avis's presentation from PV1. In this episode, Rob's going to touch on a bunch of things to be thinking about when you're starting a permaculture-based business. Things like keep your capital costs low when starting a business. Is the business scalable? Is the risk asymmetrical? Is the business anti-fragile? Can you stack other businesses or services into that business down the road? And can your market afford you? A lot of goodies are in here. This episode is dense. You're probably going to want to listen to it a few times. I don't think you're going to get every little nugget out of this one the first time through. And if you might be thinking, well, business isn't really for me. If you're thinking that, let's look no further than this quote that goes, if you don't build your dreams, someone will hire you to help build theirs. So let's get into it. Three keys to starting a successful permaculture-based business with Rob Avis. How many people here are currently running a business? Put your hand up. Awesome. And how many people are looking to start a business within this field? Okay, great. So the, if you answered yes to those two questions, you're going to get a, a ton out of this, this talk. We're going to take about 45 minutes um, to go through a process that uh, Michelle and I have distilled over the last couple of weeks, um, kind of looking at how we managed to get to where we are. And we're going to talk about some of our successes and some of our failures um, being that we're engineers, we're very process-driven. Um, that works to our favor, but it can also work against us sometimes. Um, and so we're going to kind of go through that process that we've created. Uh, and I know it's going to it's going to be really helpful for uh, for you if you even if you're in a business right now or if you're looking to start a business up. Um, all right. So uh, as you guys heard in the introduction, um, we're both mechanical engineers, um, and Actually, before I was a mechanical engineer, I actually worked uh, in my dad's cake factory. I'm Charlie in the chocolate factory. Um, we would put out, you know, 50 to 60,000 cheesecakes in a day. Um, so here I am teaching about decentralized energy and local food, um, and I've cut my teeth, if you will, uh, in the industrial food system and industrial energy system. So it's kind of interesting how our backgrounds kind of inform where we end up going. And... Um, so we were both working in the oil and gas industry and you know, really challenged by our jobs doing uh, pipeline and facilities type engineering. <clears throat> and we felt really conflicted. We felt really conflicted because on one hand, um, you know, we were using natural gas to heat our home. We were driving our car with gasoline. I was the very person that was bringing this stuff to market. And how could I criticize the very industry that I was supporting as a consumer? And that's always driven me nuts about the environmental movement, is that we'll sit in one sphere and talk badly about an industry, and then we'll hop into our car or our heated house or our air-conditioned building um, and kind of ignore the fact that we're part of the problem. And so that really bugged me. And the more I started looking into things like peak oil and and all sorts of problems that we don't need to get into today... um, I started to believe this myth, and it's a myth that you guys are all well aware of, It's this myth that humans are inherently destructive. We get this myth all the time through Facebook, through the internet, through newspapers, through the media. And uh, that really started to bug me, and I started to believe it. It's a really negative um, thing. And and anyways, you know, we didn't really know where to go. Serendipity struck one day. I actually got Jeff Lawton's five-minute video, Greening the Desert. And my life has ever, from from that point on, has been different. Because shortly thereafter, we quit our jobs, we traveled around the world, we spent probably close to two years 
going to different places around the world. Um, and we didn't realize it at the time, but we were actually picking up different business models. And so we spent time in, at a Renewable Energy Institute in Denmark for six months, learned everything we could. Being from the energy industry, we wanted to get a really firm understanding of, of, of the energy side of things. And while we're all talking about how we can't repower our communities in and our, and our, and North America, Denmark's doing it. So we left Denmark with this really good feeling in our gut that, okay, that's another myth we've just busted. We're talking about how it can't be done. They're going to do it probably within the next 10 or 15 years. They're going to be 100% renewable. Um, we traveled all through Western Europe. We looked at low energy buildings. We looked um, at biogas plants, solar energy, wind turbines, like the, you name it, we did it. Um, and then we came back to North America and we traveled uh, through lots of the United States, through Mexico, Central America. We knew leaving Denmark we could repower the world, but we weren't sure how we were going to feed the world. And this permaculture thing kept bumping up in my head, and I was like, oh, man, I've really got to explore that. And so towards the end of that first sabbatical that we took, I took my first PDC, and I was totally hooked. I didn't really know how I was going to integrate that information in, as an engineer, um, but it's evolved very nicely since then. And um, since then, since that first PDC, we've, I've spent six months in Australia. Uh, we've been to the Middle East. Um, and parts of Africa, <clears throat> and I can tell you assuredly that the world does actually look very positive in the future if we would just if we just engage ourselves. And um, one of the interesting things that I learned coming back from all of this was that there are no jobs doing what I wanted to do. So leaving engineering, I, I had no, like I'll just give you an example of my education. I didn't get a design project until year six like an actual design project that I could like cut my teeth with as an engineer. I spent all that time learning calculus and all of these other design methodologies. Um, and it, so when I found permaculture, it was like, oh man, now I can actually, I have a tool to contextualize and create process for all of this information that I have over here. And when the two of them got together, they had babies. And, uh, and one of the babies was Verge Permaculture. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we created, uh, created Verge and um, also the, the projects that we're working on right now. We're actually going to create another company. Like we don't have enough work already, um, we're, we're going to actually form another company in the next little while. So, um, And I guess before I, I get into this process, I just want to say that my goal is not green business. I look at green business as a vehicle. My goal is earth repair. My, my goal is sustainable livelihood. My goal is to create space for people to pursue their passions. We all have tons of passions which are locked up inside of us because we end up doing jobs that, we, we, that don't allow us to expand um, and, and express these passions. And I was saying this last night, but we all are gifted, if we're lucky, with about 600,000 life hours of energy and it's up to us to use every single one of those hours as valuably, as, in the best way that we can. And so green business basically allows me to create my own job doing the stuff that I want to do, which is to fix the planet and to create community. Um, and so by doing all of this, I've met some amazing people along the way. And um, I know that this opportunity is open to tons of other people because one of the things that starting a business has taught me is there's so much opportunity out there. It's just waiting to, to go and get grabbed. And so I'm going to give you a process tonight, three steps that you can follow that will, first of all, help you to figure out how to find what you should be doing. Um, secondly, how to design what you should be doing. And thirdly, how to communicate what you should be doing. And I like to think about this process as a stool. The stool is only as good as the weakest link. You need all three legs in order to be able to, to make a strong platform to stand on. Um, there's tons of other stuff within building a business that you need to be aware of outside of these three things, but these are the three pillars that we've identified as being the most important. So gathering intelligence, designing your business, and communicating it. So intelligence gathering, some people might call this market analysis, and I don't think market analysis is enough. Okay? If you're just interested in making money, then probably market analysis is enough. But if you're interested in, in firing up your passion, creating change, and inspiring people, you need 
not only market intelligence, you need personal intelligence. You need to go in deep inside and figure out what your passions and where your strengths are. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that. Um, and I, I'll just put a little story onto that. So I failed all of my biology classes in university and in high school, and now I'm teaching about it. Um, I'm not going to say it's my, it's my strongest strength, um, but the point is, is that once I found a way to contextualize biology, once I found a way to attach it to my passion, I learned it so quickly, and it just made so much sense, and it tied into so many of the things that I had already learned. Um, and, and that's why I'm such a big fan of passion-based businesses, passion-based learning. Um, when you tap into that core, things that seemed insurmountable before become easy. And all the barriers just kind of disappear, and you can spend all your energy just charging towards this goal of, of yours. So number one is, um, what are your passions and strengths? And uh, for me, my passions and strengths are thermodynamics. So I love understanding how energy moves through a system. Um, I love fluid dynamics. I love how water and fluids move through a system and how a system interacts with those fluids. And I love the nexus between those two and biology because biology is the ultimate teacher and it's the ultimate engineer and we can learn so much from it um, in the way that we go about doing design. And I think that's something that's really missing in the engineering world. It's starting to come in now, but, uh, but it's still this fringe thing. And so when you get those three things together, you can do really, really exciting things. Um, in addition, like... In addition to, to working in a passion-based business, so you're going you're to really love working in a business that, where you're pursuing your passion. Um, in the last couple of years, especially since having kids, I've really noticed the need to find things in my life, I think some people call it life hacking, um, where I can put one unit of energy in and get 10 out. And this has become like I said, really apparent since I've had kids, part of that is figuring out where your strengths are. Okay? And so I took this PDC and I came back to Calgary and I started putting in gardens all over the place. Gardens and food forests, awesome stuff and really important work. But I'm an engineer. And, um, and so even though I think I can make really nice looking designs, um, I don't have necessarily the artistic skills of an artist. Um, and so my best use of energy is not necessarily directed at gardens and food forests. I've got a ton more horsepower that I can pl apply in different areas. So in addition to figuring out where your passion is, it's really important to figure out where all your horsepower is too. And then you have to kind of figure out how you're going to apply that. And that's really important because there's kind of two ways of going about finding a business. And one is you can just create a product and then market the heck out of it and hope people buy it. Or number two is you can actually go in and gather intelligence in a, in, a, in a way I'm going to talk about in a few seconds um, and collect the problems that are not being solved right now and then hopefully find that intersection point between your passion and your strengths and the problems that need fulfilling. And if you do it properly, business development becomes really, really simple. So my passion, like I said, is thermodynamics, fluid dynamics, um, and the intersection of biology, and I'm an engineer. Okay, so that kind of describes my passions and my strengths. And, um, and so over the last couple of years, I've been thinking, like, how can I really apply that horsepower? And it's not necessarily in the urban system. It's in a slightly larger system. In addition, I really love systems thinking. And so I've been thinking lately that I need to be applying these design tools, this matrix of solutions, which is what I call a permaculture design course, to much larger liabilities, much larger problems. So on the municipal scale, on the corporate scale. I mean, we've got this massive oil and gas industry which is reaping havoc all over Alberta, and they don't have nearly a fraction of the solutions that we're talking about in this room right now. And so we need to go and get in front of the people that represent these problems, and we need to show them a process-based approach with regards to how we're going to solve them. But if you don't understand what the problems are, you can't go about solving them. So once you figure your strengths out, once you figured out your passions, you can actually start to talk to the people that hold these problems. So for me, I'd be interviewing municipalities, or I'd be interviewing oil companies, or I'd be interviewing any corporation that has... We all have problems. Every company and person has problems. And we're all looking for someone to come to us magically out of the blue and say, oh, man, 
I have this amazing solution for you, and it can do these things. And what do you think about that? And is that a fit for, for where we're going? And, and bam, you've got, you've got this idea. So what we're doing right now to create this new business that we're, we're starting is we're actually uh, systematically going out and interviewing people. And, and I ask them all the hard questions. So I'll, talk, I'll call somebody and say, so what kind of opportunities do you see within this field? Like really open-ended questions. What kind of barriers do you see within this field? So what's stopping you from getting to those opportunities? And, um, and, and really kind of understanding the, the framework uh, with regards to how this organization works. And they'll just tell you freely. It's like, oh, we've got this problem, we've got this problem, we've got this problem. And if you're smart, you can even ask the question, what's the solution to that problem worth? Is it a $100,000 problem? Is it a half-million-dollar problem? Is it a million-dollar problem? Bam. Now you've got some context with regards to how you're going to go about um, uh, making a proposal for these people. And um, we'll talk a little bit about how to, how, to, how to get those jobs. And what's been really interesting about this process is that along the way, I've ended up with a bazillion, uh, not a bazillion, but a lot of, of mentors. Um, and they've been amazing people. They've been engineers in their 70s you know, who, who are not in, it, in the game for money anymore. And they just want to see me succeed. And so they take me out for lunch all the time. I get tons of free food, and I got tons of free advice. Um, and then, you know, I've got an economist that's working with me right now. And these are all really high-level guys that, that really get off on permaculture, and they, can't, they haven't spent any of their time learning about it. And they spent all their time being really good at what they're really good at, and they, they get really excited about what I'm doing. And then they see all of these opportunities that I can't see, and they know things that... Um, What's that saying that Darren Doherty has? You don't know what you don't know, or you don't know what you need to know. And one of the amazing things about having mentors and coaches is that they can open your eyes to things that, that are not even on your radar and can end up saving you tons and tons of money and time down the road. And time is the ultimate commodity. So it's really good to get mentors, even if you have an established business. Um, you know, One of my friends, Elise Watson, has a group of people. It's called a board of excellence. And so she's got lawyers and all sorts of people on there that help direct her in, um, in her business and, and help her to see things that she can't see. So the sweet spot here is trying to collect those problems, trying to understand where your strengths and passions are, and look at the intersection. And you're probably going to come up with more opportunity than you can, than you can manage. You're going to see more things that you can go and solve with your little tool belt of solutions than you can go out and solve. And so what we need to do next is we actually have to distill these opportunities down to make sure that, um, to make sure that we're picking the right option. And that's really important. So just a couple photos here. Um, Michelle and I traveled, like I said, to Australia. Um, one of the great things about traveling around the world and coming to conferences like this is this an amazing place to gather intelligence. Um, I actually think the price tag on this conference was actually too cheap because if you're doing your job properly and you're talking to the right types of people at this conference, you're going to get all sorts of business models. And the beautiful thing is people are coming from all over the world here, and so we're really not going to be stepping on each other's toes by sharing our information with each other. All we're doing is supporting each other so that we can go out and create really successful enterprises um, and, and proliferate this idea around the globe and ultimately do what we've set out to do, which is earth repair. So we have this relationship with Nick and Kirsten from Milkwood Permaculture. They've been absolutely amazing. They run a very similar business to us. They let us touch their business and, and work on their farm. Um, we, we spent a ton of time with Jeff Lawton and Nadia, um, and we, we hit as many farms as we could in Australia while we were there, and we saw as many different permaculture businesses and renewable energy businesses as we could, and we asked them as, as many of the hard questions as we possibly could. It cost us a ton of money to do it, but um, ultimately, it's more than paid for itself uh, in relationships and with ideas and opportunities that we, just, we don't even have time to, to, um, to get access to. So one of the great things that I, I get to do in my job is I get to fire out, like my PDC is basically green entrepreneurial ideas with a bit of permaculture there's a lot of permaculture in it, but um, I love coming up with niches that people can gain access to through that PDC, through that PDC lens. So we spent time at Eco Villages. Um, we drank quite a bit of beer at Oktoberfest. That was an awesome intelligence gathering uh, situation. 
Um, we got to climb up in those monster turbines, and, and overall, we just had amazing experiences. It really rounded out uh, our engineering degree, if you will. Um, so the next step is designing your business, and this is really about distilling down those opportunities that you've found by going out and collecting those problems. You really don't have time to do more than one thing, and one of the things that really is hard about permaculture is that it's this holistic design system that does everything. For everybody. But you can't do everything for everybody. You really have to be able to choose your niche. I'm just going to put a plug in for Javin Bernakovich. He's speaking on Sunday at 12.45. Is that right? Um, specifically on finding your niche. So if, if you don't have your niche or you have a business right now which is not hyper clear and, and like crystallized with regards to what it is that you do, and I'm going to give you a concrete example of that in a second, I'd highly recommend you go check out his workshop because um, Javin's been creating his own process specifically on finding a niche. So you're going to come in with this bucket of, of ideas, and we've really got to distill it down into a couple of ideas and then uh, choose one of those ideas that come out the other end based on their merits. <clears throat> so number one, um, I'm a huge fan of low-capital startup businesses. And there's this misconception out there that in order to create a profitable business, you have to put tons of money out. I'm not going to say that starting a business is free, and sometimes it can cost a little bit of money, but what's beautiful about the internet and about the way marketing trends are going and some of the, the stuff that we've talked about already in terms of collecting intelligence is that you don't need an enormous amount of money to get started up. So Verge Permaculture, I think, was started with 5000 bucks, not including all the traveling that we did. Um, we could have done it without the traveling if we had got on the phone and paid some long distance fees. But um, so Verge itself was a really low capital startup. Um, you know, I'll just give you an example. I have a friend who runs a consignment clothing store, and he had to put a hundred grand into this store in order to get it going. And now he's barely making a livelihood for himself. He's like he's really struggling to sell enough clothes, and and I really saw this with my dad's business. So we had this $20 million a year business. That was the gross. And we were producing cheesecakes at you know, $2 profit per cheesecake. And it might sound like a lot, but it's not. And, and, um, and just, so just because he had this really expensive business, we ended up being in a volume game. And what is really awesome about permaculture is that it's unique. So you can be completely unique in your offering, which means that you, you can stand, your, stand alone amongst your peers. And, um, and that means that well, consulting is a great example of this. Consulting can be actually a really profitable business if, if you figure out what you're really good at and what you have a passion to do um, without a lot of capital. Um, number two is it's scalable. So are you going to hit brick walls really early in the game where you just can't get any further, either because you don't have enough time or you're not valuing your services enough or your services just don't even have that much value? I mean, these are all questions that you have to ask. I've seen very few businesses that are not scalable. Um, one of the great tools within the permaculture curriculum is needs and yields. And so if you're finding that you're coming up against a brick wall, you probably haven't thought laterally enough with regards to different opportunities and options that exist. So most businesses are, but, uh, but, you, but it's definitely a question that you want to try and think about on the front end. Number three is the risk asymmetrical. Um, asymmetrical risk basically means that the upfront risk is relatively low, but the downside opportunity is relatively high. So I come back to consulting. It's an asymmetrical risk because if I totally screw up, I've maybe got a website, I maybe have some business cards, I've spent some of my own time trying to promote myself, and like, I've gained all this amazing intelligence that I've gone and collected to try and, and, and learn about these problems. So it's really not that risky of a, of a, um, a business. Um, number four, this is a question that I didn't ask going into to Verge, but it's extremely valuable. Is your business anti-fragile? So what do I mean by that? Fragility, or anything that is fragile, means that if you hit something, it'll break. It's fragile. Anti-fragile means that when you hit something or you give something an impact, that it actually improves. It re its re impact is required to the sustenance of that system. So when you think about a grassland, a grassland actually benefits from impact. Okay? So we want our business. We all know we don't need to talk about the economy today. We don't need to talk about the state of the world and where things are going. And what I really love about this concept, there's a great book called Anti-Fragile, is that trying to predict things is a complete waste of time because you're guaranteed to get it wrong. 
You could say, well, this event is going to happen by this time. You'll get it wrong, guaranteed. There's a million possible outcomes. Statistically, it's not on your side. But what we can do is we can say, well, what will happen if we know that something like this, this type of an event, like we're going to run out of oil eventually, is going to happen, how is my system going to respond to that type of an event? Not worrying about when. We know it's fairly inevitable, um, but how is it going to respond? So an example of a great anti-fragile business, which maybe isn't all that ethical, is alcohol. So when the economy crashes, guess what happens? People consume more booze. When the economy is really good, guess what happens? People still consume booze. So Verge in itself is its not as anti-fragile as I'd like it to be, but in, in an upturn economy, people take courses, they learn how to go take care of themselves, and that's great. We build community, we make some money, um, we build this community around ourselves. In a downturn turn economy, on the back end of Verge, we're doing all this stuff to our house, so we're retrofitting it, We've got all these skills that we've built up. So now we grow our own food. We've built passive solar greenhouses. We've got renewable energy systems. We're taking care of ourselves. And most importantly, we've got all this social capital around us. So from that perspective, it's actually really anti-fragile. That's one of the things that we're lacking most is that community uh, equity, um, which is one of the most amazing things that happens when you start doing this type of work. So ask yourself, is it anti-fragile? Is it going to benefit from shock? Okay. And, and that's not a, a pessimistic thing. All ecosystems benefit from shock. So we want to design, we want to pattern our businesses around ecosystems. Most businesses don't take this into account before they start. So is your service going to be needed in bad times and in good? Um, sorry. Um, does it stack? Are there other things that you can stack onto this enterprise down the road? And again, I haven't seen too many businesses where you can't find other stackable things. Joel Salton has these ancillary farms that he attaches onto his thing. He's built this. Like every business is kind of like a giant ferry or, or a tanker running through the water. And it creates this wake of value behind it. And what you'll find when you get into business is you don't have enough hours in the day to go and capture all of that value. But there's opportunities for you to be able to get other people to come in and capture that value. So within my design course, we have tons of students that want to start green businesses, but they don't necessarily have the network to get started. Well, I've built this network. I've got this huge community around me in southern Alberta. And we've got all these things that I, I just don't have time to go and do. And so there's opportunities to stack other enterprises into what Verge does that's mutually beneficial to me, it's mutually beneficial to the community, and it's mutually beneficial to this person that wants to create a livelihood where there doesn't exist a job in the area that they want to work. So there's almost always going to be places to stack. And number, the last one is, can your market afford you? This is so important. Um, to think about, because if you have this awesome idea, but the market that you want to go after can't afford you, you're in deep trouble. And that's not to say that we shouldn't try and encourage people that can't afford our services into what we do. There's lots of innovative ways that we can do that. I'm absolutely all about supporting people that don't have the income to necessarily afford our services. We can volunteer in community groups. We can offer scholarships. We can um, give our consultancy rates uh, at cost and, and, and donate them. There's all sorts of things that we can do. But ultimately, if you can't sustain your livelihood, you're going to burn out. And if you burn out, you're no good to the system anymore. So I think it's really important that we have the self-confidence to be able to go out there and charge what, based on the value that we provide, number one, um, but even bef actually before no that number one, you have to figure out, can your market afford you, and is there enough demand for what the service or product that you want to offer? This is another thing that I don't think gets taken to into account very often, is managing risk. I've seen a lot of businesses fail. They start up, and, um, and then they end up crashing and burning because they didn't think about this risk thing up front. <clears throat> so there's kind of two layers of, of managing risk. Number one, you need enough money within your own system or energy in your roots, if you will, um, to keep you going while you're trying to get this business going. So putting groceries on the table, paying rent, all of those types of things. But on a deeper level, and a more important level, I think it's absolutely crucial that we have enough money in the system so that you can be completely indifferent to sales. So when you start a business, you're going to have to sell. And this is a really contentious point for people because, I mean, when I got into it, I did not want to sell anything. I hate sales, or I did at the time. And the reason we all hate sales and marketing is because it all comes across so icky. You know, like, we've all met those people that kind of push their stuff on us, and we're just like, oh, man, I, I don't like this. Um, 
infomercials and stuff like that. And, um, and so we get into, we, one of the things that probably holds us back from starting a business is this idea that I'm going to have to sell my services to people. Now, if you've got some money in the bank account that will support you for a period of time or you've got a part-time job, one of my friends works for a school bus company. So he, he drives kids in the morning and in the afternoon, and then he's got six hours during the day to run his business. And that little bit of work he does in the morning and in the afternoon allows him to be indifferent to the sale. So if somebody comes to me or I, I talk to somebody and, and I'm, I'm completely indifferent to whether they buy my product or not, now my goal is not to try and push myself onto them. My goal is to try and figure out, is what I have to offer a fit? Because I want to work with clients that I absolutely love. And I don't want to ever feel like I'm in a situation where I have to pitch to that client. So I create a product that's, that fundamentally solves a problem that's in the market that's based on the intelligence that I just did. And now my job is to go out and find those exact same people and offer this service that's going to make their life way better. And I can't do that if I'm desperate, if I need to make that next sale in order to put groceries on the table. So managing risk. So let's go through this quickly here. Um, so Verge Permaculture, is it scalable? Absolutely. We've got consulting, we've got the network, and then we've got other instructors that can come in and teach for us. So we've got multiple value streams coming through there. Is it risk asymmetrical? You bet. We've got the low capital startup. We've got a medium upside. Education is not the most profitable business out there, um, but it still uh, pays enough to, to put groceries on the table, pay, rent, uh, pay the rent, and, and have money left over at the end. Um, and what's amazing is the community that gets built on the other side. That's the really biggest piece of value that we get out of it. Um, and then there's high upside. One of the biggest upsides as well, from a monetary perspective, is being able to... Uh, look at the market. And so I'm constantly seeing niches and opportunities that are not being fulfilled within my bioregion. Does it stack? You bet. So it's got a network of consultants. So Verge Permaculture now has a global network of consultants that it can call in to solve problems that are not even, uh, with solutions that are not even on the table right now. So the stuff that we talk about in this room is not even being discussed on a municipal level. It's not being discussed on a corporate level. None of these things are being discussed. And so um, if the, the opportunity is not being discussed, then it ostensibly doesn't exist. And so we have to find ways to get those opportunities and those solutions into the areas that, where it's not being talked about. It's built us credibility. It's allowed others to enter the market. So as we've become more specialized in what we do, we've left opportunities around us for other people to come into the market and start doing other things, whether it's teaching courses or doing consulting. That's been really important to building a community and building a, a group of people. If you look on our website, we've got 10 grad videos um, which detail out what our grads are actually going and doing with their PDCs. So they're actually doing concrete things, starting concrete businesses or projects, and they're going out and they're changing southern Alberta. Um, and then the other thing is it's provided professional improvement for Michelle and I. <clears throat> so we're constantly learning more, improving our skills, and, and meeting new people. Um, so in an upturn, we teach. In a downturn, we produce. And, um, you know, one of the amazing things about what I've learned over the last 10 years as an engineer and, and now as a permaculture designer is I know how to look at land. And land is one of those anti-fragile opportunities in a lot of cases. So I can actually guide investment, which, which is hugely anti-fragile. Number three is communications. Um, your communications should be written in a way that a grade six person can understand what you do. So I've got a buddy in Red Deer, who's just north of me, and from Calgary, and he started this project called the Megawatt. And Megawatt was this really cool idea where he was going to take a garage, attach a geodesic dome to it, put aquaponics in it, renewable energy systems, like all stuff that you guys understand. And on his website he said, the Megawatt, Megawatt is microenergy generating garage assembly, geodesic domes, climate battery, environmental impact, subterranean heating and cooling system, closed loop, zero waste, aquaponics, aeroponics. Who in the heck is going to know what that is? You know, we're, we're not trying to sell these to people who are already doing this stuff. We're trying to get people into this type of thing that don't know about it. And so he worked with a friend of mine named Tad Hargrave, and they redesigned it, and they called it the food garage. Okay, you're about to find out how to turn your garage into a veritable organic grocery store that can feed a family of four for an entire year, produce all the renewable energy that you'll need to do it, 
Learn practical skills that will amaze your, your friends and family and seriously increase your property value all in the comfort of your backyard. Bam, done. And, um, and so we have to really clarify our communication because a confused mind says no. So to communicate it, you really have to ask yourself four questions. What, who, where, and why? So hopefully we figured out what you're going to do based on these interviews that you're going to talk to based on the people that you found who represent the problems that you're trying to solve. And hopefully those problems are going to be aligned with your passion and your strengths. Um, so now we've dealt with the, the what and the who, because by talking to these people, you're also going to identify who your target market is. It's really important to identify the type of person or the type of business that, or yeah, person or business that represents your target market, because if you don't know that, then you don't know who to go and talk to see if your solution fits. So as an example, if I was growing medicinals for, um, for midwives, like calendula and raspberry leaves uh, and comfrey, um, and I knew that, my, that I wanted to specifically grow herbs for, for that target market, well, now I could talk to doulas, and I could talk to midwives, and I could talk to um, anybody in the natural birthing community. I mean, once I've clarified that out, I know exactly where to find my target market. It becomes really, really easy to customize the marketing uh, and the communication to those types of people. So you can start to figure out where they hang out. But if you don't know who they are, then you can't figure out where they, where they exist. And the last one is why. And <clears throat> again, talking about, uh, coming back to my friend Tad Hargrave, he's got this website called Marketing for Hippies. And this is one of the best analogies that he's ever given to us. Um, we used Tad initially to help us to clarify our own communication platform. As you know, it's really hard to communicate what permaculture is. So you've got all these people sitting on island A, and they're unhappy. They've got this problem that they can't solve, and they can see all these people on island B that are really unhappy in their life because, or sorry, island B, which are really happy because they've got their problem solved. The problem is, is you've got this ocean in between the two islands, and it's infested with sharks and currents and riptide, and you can't get across. Now, most businesses, if you look at most business websites, um, and most businesses in general, will talk about how awesome their boat is. Your business is just a boat. It's a delivery mechanism to get people from island A to island B. And, and that's the service. People don't really care about your boat outside of the fact that it's seaworthy and it's going to get them there. What people care about is the journey that you're going to take them on and, and, and where you're going to get them to. Okay? That's really, really important. So you can think about that analogy with regards to how you go about communicating what you do to your target audience. So we started Verge, and when we first started, like every permaculture business, we said, well, this is for everybody. This is amazing stuff. Everybody should take this course. Um, and as we went through the last three years, something really interesting happened. So uh, in year three, up to year three, we had amazing feedback on all the consulting and, and courses that we were doing. And then in the third year, we had a few people come up to us and say, man, like, you really need more dialogue in your courses. And I'm an engineer. I'm, I'm a like a technically driven gearhead geek. Like I deliver content in a specific way. Um, and so my courses are highly technical. They, they bring in all the engineering stuff that I've got over here with all the permaculture stuff over here. And so it's a, I'm not a fit for everybody. People, not everybody that takes my courses are going to walk away feeling totally empowered and engaged and ready to go, uh, at least in our initial model. And so what we did in year four was we hired a facilitator. We said, okay, let's bring a facilitator in we're going to create more dialogue, we're going to create more conversation, and, uh, and soften down the technical stuff a little bit. And what's really interesting is we ended up having this revolt by all the people that really loved the way that I taught. The people that came to me specifically because I was an engineer, and because I was technical, and I approached things in a very process-oriented format. And that was the aha moment. It's like, all right, so the, the market has developed enough now. There's enough niches opening up that we need another PDC teacher in southern Alberta that specializes in dialogue-based courses that's a little softer than the way that I teach. And I need to become more specialized in, in who I offer my courses to. And so now the tagline on our, on our um, website is permaculture for career-changing professionals and entrepreneurs. Because I resonate really well with technical people, blue collar, white collar, <clears throat> um, and people who are, have an entrepreneurial spirit because my course is entirely geared towards people starting green business or creating changes within their existing business or their existing career. And, if, and, and, and those are the perfect people to engage the type of stuff that we do. And the same thing goes with our consulting. We're going to create a consulting page 
that is entirely focused around the fact that we're engineers, we bring this process-oriented thing with us, we happen to have all these other design tools that we've collected over the last 10 years, and, and we still have to kind of define that out, but it's going to be really, really clear about the type of people that we're going to go after um, to work with. <clears throat> So in conclusion, we've talked about gathering intelligence, designing your business, um, and communicating it. All really important things, and there's lots of little tiny small things within there um, that you need to think about. And, uh, you know, never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that I'd be speaking at a conference like this. Um, I could never have forecast this event today. Um, and I've got this great saying that was given to me after, shortly after I took my uh, my PDC at the Bullock Brothers farm, um, we came in and we, uh, we put a food forest onto our property. And I was like, man, how is this going to turn into anything that I'm going to generate revenue from? Like, what is this going to do? And my mother-in-law said to me, you'll over-anticipate what you do in one year, and you'll under-anticipate what you do in five. And this is the fifth year right now. And so um, the trick with starting a business is starting. You've got to take one step at a time. Um, and take a small, anti-fragile, asymmetrical risk type step. So our first step, we actually hired an introduction to permaculture teacher to come in and teach that first class for us. We used that to gauge the kind of excitement level around this idea, which didn't exist in Alberta at all. Permaculture is not like it is down in the States. It's, it's pretty low-key still. It's just starting to build momentum. And from there, we was like, okay, we, we, we decided that there was an opportunity. So if you have a passion and... There's nobody else offering you a job that allows you to pursue that passion. I'd highly recommend that you guys check out starting a business, um, at least experimenting with the idea. The opportunities are just growing exponentially right now. Um, I'm, I'm kind of quasi writing a book about all the opportunities that I see within the permaculture world um, as we speak. And um, what's really interesting about this conference, I'll just throw this out there, is we're actually seeking... Um, successful and engaged people that are kind of working within this space. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen, but we've got a video camera out in the garden there during the day. And we're actually trying to gather intelligence and s spread your story as well around how people are making a livelihood within the permaculture world. So if that speaks to you and you want to come and share your story, come talk to myself or my wife, Michelle, and we'd love to potentially interview you. So um, I'm going to open it up for questions and invite my wife up, and uh, we'd happily answer any questions that you have about green business or what we've done. I hope that you liked this episode. It's dense, like I said at the beginning. You may have to listen to this one again to get everything out of it. But that's the nice thing about podcasts like this. You just hit replay, listen again, it's free. Rob did an absolutely spectacular job with this presentation, and Rob is brilliant when it comes to blending permaculture with business. If you're somebody who's into permaculture and you're into business, or you want to go into starting a business, and you're looking for a really good PDC to take, check out the PDC that Rob does in Calgary. For more information on that, visit vergepermaculture.ca. I think that the stuff that Verge does is top of the line. And I don't say this lightly because I know there's a lot of garbage out there. There are very few PDCs that I would recommend to anyone. And I feel very confident that anyone taking a PDC with Rob will get over and above value out of it. This is one of the PDCs to take. Be sure to check them out at vergepermaculture.ca. It's good stuff, no fluff. If you like this episode, another related episode that you'll also probably want to listen to is episode number 60. That's Jack Spierko's PV1 talk, Building a Profitable Permaculture-Based Business. That's another one that's really dense. Between these two episodes, you'll get a pretty good overview on how to start approaching and designing potential businesses. If you want even more content, then check out the show notes for this episode at permaculturevoices.com slash B016. On that page, you'll find the finished videos of the interviews that Rob alluded to in this episode. There are three videos there that are full of little nuggets of wisdom from a variety of people within the permaculture realm, including Jeff Lawton, Jack Spierko, Dave Bainline, Donega Markey Garden, me. 
I love this topic of business, and I love pulling this topic of business into permaculture because business is how I think a lot of us in the world can change. I think a lot of people struggle to go out and be the change they want to see in the world because they don't have financial freedom. They don't have the ability to control their own destiny when it comes to finances. And I think if you can start to control your own destiny when it comes to finances, then you can start to live more in line with your values. Maybe that means starting your own business, or maybe that means just working for a company that has similar values to you. But either way, I think we can use business to pull change through the system, meaning sell people products that are produced ethically and value the triple bottom line, and then use the proceeds from that business to support the on the ground change that we all want to see. Again, make sure you have a look at those three videos on the show notes page, because I think they're going to give you a lot of insight into how business can change the world. And I think they're going to give you a lot of insight into what the value of a conference is like this and what the value of PV2 will really be. It's business inspiration, it's business connections, it's business idea generation. It's taking things to the next level. It's trying to help you monetize that permaculture life that you want to lead, but you can't lead it because you don't have a way of cash flowing it. Well, here's a way to get ideas on how to do that from people doing it. People that are in the agriculture side, people in the design side. This conference will give you new perspectives. It'll present you with new opportunities out there in the business realm. You can see what's being done outside of your bioregion that you could then do in your bioregion, and it'll connect you with a whole bunch of people that can support that. Maybe you have skills that you want to plug into an existing business. Maybe you're looking for somebody who has specific skills that you can use in your own business. Those people will be there. And top that off with a whole bunch of practical information that you can use to bolster your business, how to make your farm more efficient, how to market better. Last year, there was an attendee at the conference, let's call her Lisa C., and she said, I drove into the conference with one business idea formulating in my head and drove home with five new ones. I think this is what you're going to get out of PV2, a lot of ideas and a lot of motivation an inspiration to take those ideas from in your head ideas into reality. In this podcast, Rob talked about selling. Selling is pitching. It's not hard selling. It's just simply presenting a case. And you're basically asking, is what I have to offer you a fit? And that's what I ask for you now for PV2. I really think at this point, Most people listening to this show have an idea of what PV2 is all about and what it has to offer. I think that it offers a lot of value if you're involved in a permaculture-based business or if you want to get involved into a permaculture-based business. If you're one of those people, come in with a plan, come in prepared, and then this event will give you way back more value than your ticket price. So you decide, is PV2 a fit for you? If it is, check out more information on the conference at permaculturevoices.com slash pv2. There you can find out a whole bunch of information about scholarships that are available, what's included when you get a ticket. There's a whole bunch of bonuses included, and you can register there for a ticket. And if you haven't heard, Alan Savory will be back to the conference this year. That's right, Alan Savory. He's back. One final ask I have is if you're on the fence about coming, think about it again. Think about this episode and think about what you might be able to get out of a conference like this. I would love to see a thousand people come out for PV2, but I need some help getting there. I need some help making this conference a success. So again, I ask you, check it out, permaculturevoices.com slash PV2, and really think about, is PV2 a fit for you? I hope to see you out in San Diego come March 4th. Between now and then, start building your dreams instead of working on someone else's. And while you're doing that, do some epic you-know-what. 